Welcome back. I'm Kim Bailey. She's Rihanna Osborne and this is Inside Exec. This week we're continuing our discussion with Taylor Proctor about motivating teams and this week Taylor introduces us to a management tool that she uses called the Big Six Plus One. And Fuliana and I were both really impressed with the potential that this has for all sorts of teams. So let's hear what Taylor's got to say. Having the team that you have with the cultures and behavior that you describe, how does that affect the client? Well, we are very, very lucky and blessed and honored and a million and one other things, just so grateful for the client that we have, the clients, we have more than one now, Mm -hmm. that we have because they really understand that growth mentality. And what's interesting is this team started out with the expectation of just doing social responses. Mm -hmm. And the client saw the potential and said, hey, What do you guys think about helping with this campaign? What do you guys think about doing this? We'd like you to do this kind of coverage on this major event. And it really shifted into, yes, we do responses and that's our daily, but we also help with campaigns. We also own projects that push the client into higher visibility and more brand advocacy that that was never the expectation up front. So very lucky and grateful to have such a client that, trusts us so much. But I think that a lot of that also comes from our collective and collaborative ability to raise our hand and say, what about this? Or raise our hand and say, can we have a little bit more clarification? We're a little unsure on this. Mm -hmm. And that's what builds trust with the client. And I think that it has, in the growth that we're seeing, uh, the addition of new clients, I think that it has this amazing ripple effect that no one really expected from the onset. Within the team, you obviously got a group that work well together it's a question now that we have asked others when they're working with these sorts of teams do you have what we call in this country starters and finishers so people who are really good at the beginning of a project and just have not not the wherewithal or the interest to see it through to the end and others in the team who love to do that finishing part love to pick up the process and carry it through to the end yes and no I have team members who I would classify as as starters. They really love organizing things and they love being able to analyze trends and put together, we have what we call like a cheat sheet. Mm-hmm. And this is like where you go to for everything we've ever asked the client for confirmation on that is a repeatable thing. And so it's like 20 pages long now. And I have a team member who's like, I want to organize that and make it more accessible. Yes, Mm. please. And so that's somebody who really likes the organization and the foundational pieces to set a project up for success. But then I have others who they really enjoy the work in the project, but aren't really ready to step into the leadership of the foundational pieces yet. And we constantly coach on that. We constantly are like, okay, we have a new project. We think this fits your strengths. And -and so-and-so, this is their strength that may be your weakness. We want the two of you to work together on this. So there's a lot of collaboration and there's, there is pairing kind of the starters with the finishers and putting them together so that they can both succeed. Mm -hmm. But we're also relatively small team right now. There's about 12 uh, with the original client and we have others with other clients and brands, but With the original team, we have a lot of that partnership and that pairing up and making sure that we find people as, as the department and the team has grown and needs more amazing talent. We've really put together a hiring process that is actually pretty fun Mm -hmm. and helps us find those a players. I, and I'm kind of stumbling over the start and the finish. I look at it like you have, and this just may be the sports upbringing, but I look at it like you have your your JV, your junior varsity team, and you have your varsity team. Yeah. And right mm-hmm. now, we're still in that like, get in there, get it done, start up, finding the right processes, fine tuning as we grow, fine tuning as more projects come our way, which is so exciting. Mm-hmm. But we're still in that process. And so really, there's not room yeah. for JV players right now. Yeah. 
you're going to have your people that will come on and will be there and will do the work. But part of what makes it such a fun environment that allows people to be psychologically safe and be their most authentic selves is the fact that we've been very selective in our hiring to make sure that we have varsity players who want to dive in, who want to have that ownership, that responsibility, and are really proud of their work and not there for the nine to five. So in that sense, it becomes an elite team. Do you have people who are desperate to join the elite team? This is a really, really funny question and very interesting. As we have put the job description out there, we've had this really interesting, like, dichotomy. We had put the client's name in the job description. And so we would get a lot of people who just wanted to have that client on their resume. Yeah. So a lot of external hires would come in and it was like all about the client. And we were like, oh, that's not like, yes, it is for the client, but we want somebody who's here because they're excited about the work, not the client, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a combination, but you got to love what you're doing day in, day out, regardless of the client. So like the external hires came for that. So we made some adjustments and some shifts to the job description. And so we get people who are actually excited about the job now, but the funny thing is, and this is a real Testament to it being an elite team. The funny thing is, is on the internal hires that would see the job opening, when we would ask, what attracts you to this role? Very first question we ask in the interview process. Yeah. What attracts you to this role? Almost every single one, like 99% would say the team. The team. The team. I, see, yeah. I see what you guys are doing and everyone looks so happy and everyone's so passionate and I can see that they're working together and I really want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And it was almost like the, the actual role itself was secondary to what they could see internally and they wanted to be a part of that, which is really neat. When you look at it in a corporate sense, that's what you want. Yep. Because that means oh, 100%. That, that those skills, that leadership style and that team environment is going to be transferable to whatever you're working on, regardless of what, what the, who the client is or, or what you're doing for them. Do you think you'll be able to maintain that speciality about the team culture as it gets bigger and bigger? That is definitely something that I have been worried about. It's been on the back of my mind as we scale this. And we have an opportunity right now that is really intriguing, which is how can we take what we've done here and operationalize and replicate it on a global scale? We're in America right now. We're looking at setting some things up in Scotland. Austria, I think, is one of them. How do we operationalize this and make it work globally for teams across the globe? And that the culture aspect is something that I think is so huge. And it's something I'm so passionate about that, yeah, in the back of my mind, I've been like, okay, what does this look like? operationally speaking. And Mm -hmm. so there's been a lot of things like cultural trainings that I think can be across that set the tone and the expectations. Mm -hmm. And then it comes down to hiring phenomenal team leads to continue to set that precedence and to train them. And this is what I, what I call it. It's servant leadership. If someone balks at the word servant, they're not the right fit because it's not, it's not getting stepped on. It's not getting walked all over. It's, I am here as a leader to serve you. Yes. Mm -hmm. My job is to help you be successful. So if you are not successful, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. And to train my team leads to start thinking that way and to be there to serve, I think is crucial as we scale globally and operationalize this. And Mm -hmm. it's funny, one of the trainings that I, that I teach that I absolutely love that I think is a crucial point to this is one of the biggest, well, since we work on social media, there's so much going around and a lot of people are very opinionated and there's this big divide that I see in communication of collaborative teams where They're friends and they talk about things that can cause other people to feel uncomfortable. Those topics are the kind of things that you talk about every day without really knowing or realizing that it might be causing a divide and a division in a team environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the trainings that I teach is, and I actually learned this at my last job, I had a 
a leader that brought this up and he gave us a very brief training, but I freaking loved it. So I was like, I'm going to elaborate when I have my own team. (laughs) It's called the big six plus one. And what it is, is you can always remember six of these and then you always forget the last one. And it doesn't matter what order you do it in. Number seven is always like, okay, what what did I, (laughs) what did I gone through? What are they all right? So it's big six plus one. And it's things like age. Don't really need to talk about age. It's not relevant Mm -hmm. and it can cause a divide and it can Mm -hmm. cause a divide both ways. Mm -hmm. Older team members may suddenly look down on younger team members like they're not as experienced because they now know their age, which simply may not be the case or vice versa. You may have younger team members know the age of an older team member and that makes them feel like, well, they're, they're not, they're out of the loop. Like they shouldn't even know how to do social media and they're Mm -hmm. on this team. Like it causes all this bias just Mm -hmm. by expressing how old you are and their guidelines. I should say this, like the training is it's guidelines. Mm -hmm. Probably shouldn't talk about these things, but I'm not telling you, you can't, it's just, Mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so age is one of them. And actually I had a situation where somebody was going off about a team lead and their age or actually a director and their age Mm -hmm. and how they felt like their age was what was keeping them from leading their team correctly. And that as that person was going on about it, I was this, I'm the same age as the person (laughs) that they were kind of bashing on. And I'm like, no way in heck that I'm going to tell you that I'm that, that old. Right. (laughs) Like you're going to now look at me totally different as a team lead and I'm not going to tell you how old I am. And so there's things like that where it's like, just, it doesn't need to be brought up. So age is one of them, sexual orientation and family situation in a world where a lot of people are choosing not to have kids. Mm. There can be some thoughts about that that can cause separation. People feel very passionate about that. In the, in the reverse order, someone who does have children may not feel comfortable coming and talking to their team member about coverage if their child, child is sick, if mm. that team member has made some comments about families with or without children, right? Mm. So, yeah. and sexual orientation, like these are things that don't, you can t- share about your family. It's part of who you are, but at the same time, is it relevant to the workplace and it may cause discrimination unnecessarily and mm. unconscious bias sometimes. Yes. So you have age, sexual orientation, and family orientation, ethnicity and race, gender, because male, female, people yep. can judge on that, politics, which I think is a given. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would hope it's a given, right? Yeah. Religion. And then the last one is income. And with income, I recommend to my team, I'm like, if you have questions about your income, you think you're being paid unfairly, like, please come talk to me. Mm -hmm. Our finance and HR department is amazing. And they do a ton of research on fair pay across the nation, regardless of gender for this role and what that scale or that scope is for this position. So I'm happy to walk through that with you. I'm happy to talk about if you do think it's unfair, like, let's see what we can do to make some changes or at least open that dialogue and discussion. However, I am someone who can do something about that and connect you with the right people who can do something about that. Talking about it to your other team members does nothing but cause comparison and division. So we have to work so closely as a team. We outline these big six plus one things every time we have a new hire with the entire team together. And I think trainings like that, at least I'm hoping, Trainings like that are one way that we can continue to maintain the culture, regardless of the team and where it's globally located, regardless of the size of the team. And having some ground rules like this that create that safety and that wonderful collaborative environment, I think is one way, at least foundationally, I'm hoping to create that culture, regardless of the size or location. Well, certainly having heard that outline, Uh, To me, my first reaction is if you're going to say all of those things when somebody first starts with the team, with all of the team there, it reinforces for everyone that how safe an environment this is because they don't have to think about any of those things. The barriers don't have to be up about any of those things that they're worried about that they may have been called out on in previous roles. And so without actually saying this is a safe environment, you are showing that it is a safe environment by addressing all of those things right at the start. So it's very impressive. I I can see how it will work. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and one thing that I love 
And I, and again, we all have that gratitude for that terrible boss that was a mentor. I ask my team, I'm like, have you ever had a situation and you don't have to share the details, but have you ever had a situation where someone's brought up one of these things in the workplace and how did it make you feel? Mm. And inevitably I'll have team members, new hires included, who will raise their hand and say, I worked at a car dealership and this was like the regular and it was so uncomfortable and so awkward and I didn't feel safe to be, to be myself. I didn't feel Mm. safe to bring up topics. I didn't feel safe to raise my hand and say, we probably shouldn't talk about that. So that sets the like, hey, you've all had crap jobs before. We've all been there. Let's change the discussion. Mm-hmm. Let's change the environment mm-hmm. and make this a great place to work and a place that you want to be and set you up for wherever you go that you can feel comfortable being like, hey, we probably shouldn't talk about that. Like we use mm-hmm. the phrase big six plus one as a as a callback word. Mm-hmm. So if someone's talking about something that makes someone else uncomfortable and it falls in this realm, then that person can say without judgment from either side, Hey guys, that sounds like a big six plus one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And everyone immediately knows, Nope, we don't talk about that anymore. We change the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We put our heads back down and we get back to work. Yeah. And it's not judgment from the person who said it. It's not judgment from the people who are talking about it. It's just a, a safe word that yeah. puts everybody back on the same plane and doesn't allow this, these discussions to happen. Yeah. That's great. Which is good because the, the control is there and then everyone knows what that control is. It's not still up to the, the leader of the team to, to call it out each time. Yes. What? Well, because the team lead might not be there all <laughs> yes, day. They're true. in meetings and things like that while the yeah. team is still being productive. Yeah. yeah. We're going to take a break in our discussion with Taylor at this point. We still have a few more things to cover. So join us next time when we will conclude our discussion with Taylor Proctor. But for now, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fiona Osborne and this is Inside Exec. Mm-hmm.